Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to Grace, and thank you for being a part of our journey through the Bible. Uh, we've come to 2 Samuel chapter 7 as uh, we continue to take a look at King David's reign. And when we left off in our previous session, as you'll probably recall, we came to the end of 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we saw King David being ridiculed by his wife Michal, uh, Saul's daughter, for leading a procession of joyful Israelites as the ark was being brought to the city of David. This was a, a grand period of time for Israel uh, as God had ushered in what we've often called an interlude of blessing. Some have called it Israel's golden age, uh, uh, an interlude of blessing for his nation. Uh, and he was doing so to give them a taste of the kingdom to come in light of the fact that they just went through that first bucket of wrath uh, because they'd not lived up to what they'd sworn they could do when they said they could obey that contract to its fullness. Now, everything was going well for David and for Israel at that time. All that is except for King David's relationship with his wife, Michal. Uh, you'll recall how she was ridiculing him for the manner in which he was expressing his jubilation um, over the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. King David had been leading up that procession as the Ark made its way toward the city of David. And being a people's king, uh, David had cast off uh, his royal garment and he was wearing only the simple linen ephod uh, as he danced before the Lord there. The Bible says with all his might, uh, we learn toward the end of chapter 6, we can just picture David uh, jumping and gyrating around, but he was clothed and he was wearing a simple linen ephod. Uh, and this was no light matter where his status-seeking wife, Michal, was concerned. And of course, King David had numerous wives by that time. She was just the first, uh, not to mention his numerous concubines, uh, as we noted in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13, where we read, and David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. So this family is really growing here as David's taking numerous wives and concubines. It's become obvious from a review of David's life that God had not chosen to use David. It's like the prophets and those before him, uh, uh, the, uh, the patriarchs, I should say. God had not chosen to use David in the mighty way that he used David based upon David's stellar performance, so the performance of David's flesh. Uh, but based solely upon what God had foreknown about David's belief. Uh, we saw how David lied to Israel's high priest at Nob, and uh, then rather than abiding by the law contract passed down through Moses that no king over Israel should multiply wives to himself, David did the precise opposite. David had numerous wives and numerous concubines, uh, according to Scripture. Yet in spite of his fleshly failures, God had great things in mind for Israel's new king, uh, which we're going to see as we make our way through chapter 7. Now to set the stage for what's coming next, let's go back to that covenant that God made with Israel just before they entered their promised land. The covenant often referred to as the Palestinian covenant. You want to take a quick look at that. We'll not go through all the details of the Palestinian covenant because we covered those in an earlier lesson in our journey through the Bible. Uh, if you want to review that lesson, by the way, it was lesson number 30. Some people ask, what lesson was that? Lesson number 30 in our journey through the Bible where we went through the Palestinian covenant uh, and we were examining Deuteronomy chapter 30 in connection with that covenant. Now, we'll not go back and rehash all the details, as I said, of the co that covenant in this lesson, but we will take a quick look at the seven issues contained in the Palestinian covenant where, where God was revealing to his nation what their future held in store for them. Uh, and he was going to, as he was going to actually exercise his name on their behalf. Keep, we keep coming back to the fact that our journey through the Bible continually takes us back to God's name and how God was proving through Israel the necessity of him exercising his name on their behalf. They'd never merit what God needed them to be. Uh, so just before they entered their promised land, God revealed these things to Moses and Moses made them known to the people. Facet number one of the Palestinian covenant revealed the fact that there would come a time when Israel would be cast out of their land altogether, the land that God had promised them. That, that fact alone was proof that Israel would not be able to do as they had sworn they were capable of doing when it came to living up to the dictates of that law contract, both faithfully and consistently. They couldn't break one. They had to do it all and all the time. And they swore they could do so. God was proving their incapacity as he's continually bringing his capacity up before them. So God was letting them know 
that they were going to fail before they ever entered the land of Canaan. Uh, however, according to the Palestinian covenant, there would come a time in Israel's future when they would repent as a nation. They'd change their thinking about the source of their righteousness. Uh, they would make a confession that they'd failed as a nation to do as they had sworn they would do when the law contract was handed down. Facets number three and four of the Palestinian covenant revealed uh, to Israel that her Messiah would return and gather them back to the land that God had promised them and, and thus the nation would be restored. restored. All that was revealed uh, to Moses to reveal to the people. Facet number five of the Palestinian covenant was the fact that Israel would function, they will indeed function in time yet future in a supernatural way. Uh, their enemies would be judged was facet number six. And when this time arrives, Israel will receive her full blessing as their promised earthly kingdom will come to fruition, which was facet number seven. All this revealed to Moses when you read through those scriptures. Many things were revealed to Israel in the Palestinian covenant, and they all had to do with what God was going to bring about where the nation he promised to make of Abram is concerned. Uh, the only thing that was not revealed in the Palestinian covenant was how God was going to bring all these things about. Now, that wasn't told them. Uh, what, was taking, what was going to take place was told to them. They were fully aware of those things. But how God would bring all those things about uh, was not revealed in the Palestinian covenant. This is what God is ready now to reveal to David as we enter chapter 7 of, of the book of 2 Samuel. What we're seeing here in Israel's interlude of blessing, as you can see, we've listed the five buckets of wrath that were sitting in Israel's future when they swore they could fill that law contract. God said, if you do it, you'll not be able to run away from my blessings. They're going to shower down upon you and you'll not be able to escape them. You'll be eating the old store when the new store comes piling in. But if you don't, and it wasn't if, it's when you don't, these things you can expect. And you can see those buckets of wrath, which your Bible is laid out according to them. And this was Israel's history. And will be her history because some of those, but the last part of that fifth bucket is lying in Israel's future. But God gave Israel a, an interlude of blessing. You can see it called the golden age there uh, through King David and beginning with Solomon, uh, the early part of Solomon's reign, in order to show them, give them a taste of what they could have if they would obey, uh, obey God like they had said they could. Now we've already mentioned numerous ways in which David was a type of Christ during this golden age, this interlude of blessing. Another of those ways is sitting at the entrance of chapter 7 here in 2 Samuel. Notice chapter 7, verse 1, and see if you can spot a type of Christ in the life of King David. The verse says, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Does that remind you of anything concerning Christ? Especially that last part. It's an open book test. I underlined it. The Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Uh, in case you haven't spotted, it's that final portion of the sentence that reads, The Lord had given him, David, rest round about from all his enemies. What God had done for David is a great picture of what the Most High God has always had in mind to accomplish for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when God does something where Christ's enemies are concerned. Here it is in the book of Psalms, chapter 110, verse 1, where the psalmist wrote, many would say, David, the Lord, God the Father, said unto my Lord, Psalms 110.1, the Lord Jesus Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Uh, and so the Lord is going to have rest from those enemies. The Lord Jesus Christ, in a sense, as God makes Christ's enemies their footstool. And here we see the Lord's given David rest round about from all his enemies. So there's another type of Christ sitting right there. This statement concerning Christ is made no less than six times in your Bible. During the time of King David's reign, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, was making King David's enemies his footstool, as David had rest round about from all those enemies we, re we read there in verse 1. Some might suppose that David's skill at being a warrior, uh, his strength and his prowess at battle strategy, or perhaps even the sheer number of forces that he had at his disposal was the reason for the peace that David was enjoying at this point in his life. Uh, but King David's capacities were not the reason for King David's victories. Uh, the reason David had been successful uh, from the time he was tending his father's sheep as a young lad all the way to this point in his life in 2 Samuel had nothing at all to do with David the man. 
it had only to do with God exercising his name on behalf of the man that the Most High God had chosen to be Israel's king. It was never about David's physical or mental abilities or capacities, nothing whatsoever. It was always about the capacity resident in the name of the Most High God and God exercising his name on David's behalf and doing so graciously. So we can see that name concept uh, all through Israel's programs. God is showing you don't have it, I have it. Cast yourself upon me, call upon my name, I'll do it for you graciously. There's nothing in you that could merit what you're going to be for me. Now watch as God begins to reveal to the king, King David, here in chapter 7, how that God intends to bring about all the things he promised would take place uh, for Israel when he revealed to them that Palestinian covenant uh, through Moses. And he's going to tell David how now. We'll begin with verse 1 uh, this time, and this time we'll add verse 2 to the mix. Here it is. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house. This is King David. And the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the God dwelleth within curtains, that curtains, would re, you recall, would be the, the portable tabernacle, that separated the outer portion of the portable tabernacle from the inner portion, the Holy of Holies. King David was concerned by the fact that he'd been dwelling in a tent structure, a, a fine structure provided for him by Hiram. He had been dwelling, or the Ark of the Covenant had been, he had been dwelling in a house made of cedar that the king of Hiram uh, had provided him as the, that king had, of Hiram had sent carpenters and masons and materials to construct that house for Israel's new king. It was a celebration of the new king and King Hiram set him up, so to speak. It's a glorious house he's given him to live in, a cedar house. Uh, you can see David's concern in this statement to Nathan. I, I think he may have begun to feel a little ashamed. He was living in this fine structure and here's the Ark of the Covenant in a tabernacle made of, of fabric. Uh, I dwell in the house of cedar, he said in that past verse, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. So David wanted something much finer for the Most High God. Uh, even though David's behavior was not always fitting David's belief, there was no shortage by this time in David's life when it came to David's belief in the Most High God, and David wanted to build a house for the Most High God. Nathan gives his reply to David's request, beginning in verse 3. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that's in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. What a statement to make, the Lord is with thee. Uh, we've looked at that previously in some studies, but uh, the Lord was with David. He had been with David from the time that David had faced, encountered Goliath. The Lord had been with David early on because he knew all about, with his foreknowledge, David's belief. Nathan gave his response to the king. Go, do everything you'd like to do for that most high God. But now the Lord was ready to give his own response to David's request. Nathan's response would be one thing. But now the Lord's going to give his response in verses 4 through 6. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Now this is what the Lord's want, wanting David to know. Thus saith the Lord, not Nathan, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I've not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent in a tabernacle. Verse 7 continues the thought there. In all the places wherein I've walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye why build ye not, or why build ye not me a house of cedar? Did he ever ask for a house of cedar? No, he'd never ask for that. You see the Lord's point here? In other words, did I ever ask why the people had not built me a house to dwell in? And now you're going to do something for me, David? If God wanted a house, he could have asked for a house. But now David's telling him he's going to build him a house. He said, are you going to do something for me? You're not doing this because I asked you to do it. That's the idea. I've not asked, I've not asked anyone to do it. Has it not been me, David, doing something for you all along? You see the point? I am the one who has been working on Israel's behalf. And I am the one who has been working on your behalf, not the other way around, David. It's about my name, David, not Israel's name and not your name. 
This is what we're going to see as God gives Nathan the, Nathan the words to say to David. God will do something. It won't be David. It'll be God. Now, notice verse 8 as we continue there. God speaking to David. Now, therefore, David, so shalt thou say unto my servant David. Uh, he's telling Nathan this, rather. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David. He's telling Nathan. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee, David, from the sheep coat. From following the sheep, I took you to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest. And it was I implied in the verse, have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. It wasn't you, David. It was I implied once again, who have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. It was God's doing. It hadn't been David's doing at all. And now David is saying, I think I'm going to build you a house. You're going to be proud of me. <laughs> It's never been about you, David. This is what God's getting across to David. It's always been about me. It's not about you and what you're going to do for me. It's about what I've been doing for you all along. This is what the Lord was showing David. As David says, I'm going to build him a house. Verse 10, 11, and the first part of verse 11. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. And I, implied once again, will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over the people, Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. I have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies. Do you see the emphasis? You see the direction that God's taking away from David as David's saying, I'm going to build you a house made of cedar. Oh, glory be, David. <laughs> it's been me all along. It's never been you. It's been me. Have I ever asked for you to do such a thing? I'm going to do all these things, David. It's going to be me that, that brings all these things to pass. This is what Israel can come to expect. It's never been about Israel's capacity to do something special uh, for me. It's always been about my capacity to do something special for Israel, God is telling David here. This is the education that God had given that nation. It's just as though God is saying, this is the education I've been giving the nation, David. This is the lesson of my name. It's not about you. Likewise, it's never been about your capacity to do something for me, David. It's always been about my capacity to do something for you. Uh, this is the lesson I've been teaching you, David, is what God's saying here. I've been exercising my name on your behalf and doing so graciously from day one, the lesson you've finally come to learn. Uh, now, God was now ready to tell David how God was going to accomplish with Israel all the things the Palestinian covenant had promised Israel would come to pass uh, and, and how he would use David in connection with God's earthly repossession plan. Here it is in the second half of verse 11. Also the Lord telleth thee, David, that he will make thee a house. See how he's just flipped it around. I'm going to make you a house, David said. No, the Lord says, I'm going to make you a house. Now understand here, I thought David wanted to make a house for the Lord. Here we see God telling David how he was going to put his Jehovah name into effect for the nation. And we see God telling David that he, the Most High God, is going to make David a house. What kind of a house do you suppose that God had in mind? You see, the critical issue, issue is sitting right here. He didn't say, well, let's just read it. Follow me carefully. Let's read the verse one more time. Also the Lord telleth David that he will make a house for David. Is that what it says? 2 Samuel 7, the last part? Uh, nope, it's not in there, is it? <laughs> it's 11b. All right, let's move to it. There it is. Also the Lord telleth thee, David, that he will make a house for you. Is that how the Lord said it? Look, at it, look back at it very carefully. Is God going to construct a house for David? That's not what the verse says. Also the Lord telleth thee, David, that he will make a house for you. Nope. The answer is no. Read it again. Also the Lord telleth thee, David, that he will make thee an house. In other words, the Lord was telling David that the house that he had in mind was David himself. The Lord was going to turn David into a dwelling place. Now this is important here because this is the Davidic covenant we're reading about. Since David was telling the Lord of his intention to give the Lord a place to reside, the Lord was just doing a flip-flop. He, he was turning it around and showing David where he, the Lord, planned to reside in the building God had in mind would not be constructed of wood or mortar or any such thing. Put simply, the Lord was telling David about his plan to take up residence in David's seed line. 
David was going to be the Lord's house in that manner. And this is how God was going to accomplish what he was going to accomplish where all the things promised in that Palestinian covenant are concerned. God was going to turn David into, house, into a house uh, where, where we know the one to come would actually uh, reside. Now, we don't see the details spelled out at this point, but we do see the idea that God wanted to get across to David while Israel's interlude of blessing was underway. God's plan called for God to become Israel's redeemer, her avenger, her deliverer, her king, her blesser, all the compound forms of his name and all the things that Israel would need for God to be for them by God himself taking up residence in the line of David in the manner of his son. Now this is, this is amazing stuff here. In that sense, God would make King David into a house for himself. Put another way, God would incarnate himself. He would take on humanity in David's seed. That's what he's telling David here. That's the idea. That's how David himself would become God's house. You're going to make a house for me? I'm going to turn you into a house. Wow, that's the exercise of God's name on David and Israel's behalf. God was going to take on flesh as a member of David's lineage. That would end up being the greatest thing the world could ever have had happen. Now, this is what the covenant called the Davidic covenant was all about. And all the while, David had been concerned about making a house for God. <laughs> uh, God was telling David that he would make his own house and that David was it. You're my house, David. You see, the Palestinian covenant had told Israel what God was going to do. Now the Davidic covenant is telling Israel, this is how I'm going to do it. And this is what he was telling David. In effect, God was saying, I'm going to become everything Israel will ever need me to be as she will need a redeemer, an avenger, a king, a deliverer, someone to bless them. And I'm going to do that be by becoming part of your lineage, David. You're going to be my house. You are the house that I have in mind for myself when it comes to the accomplishment of all that Israel will need, need me to be on their behalf. Now notice the words of the psalmist in Psalms 132 verse 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, referring back, but he will not turn from it, or he will not turn from it, of the fruit of thy body, David, will I myself set upon thy throne. Wow, this is amazing how God's going to accomplish. A passage we need to read in conjunction with Psalms 132.11 is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So let's quickly look at that one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All the compound names of Jehovah are resident in these titles right here. And notice they all have capital letters because they are titles. They go hand in hand with the compound names of Jehovah. And that son was born because that son was placed into David's seed line. Verse 7, of the increase of his government, God's son, and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, not anyone else. No one will bring this about but the Lord of hosts himself. And his zeal to bring this about. Chapter 7 in the book of Second Samuel is an extremely important chapter in that this is where God decided to place the Davidic covenant right here in chapter 7. You have... Uh, you have to love the final portion of, chap of, of verse 7 there. Uh, not chapter 7, but verse 7. It's chapter 7, verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. It's chapter 9, verse 7, sorry. The zeal of the Lord is going to perform this. I love that. This wasn't something that Israel could perform for God, would ever be able to perform for God. It wasn't something that zealous David could perform for the Lord. This is something God himself would bring to pass on David's behalf. And on behalf of the nation, he promised to make of Abram. And the Lord is zealous to do this. It's his zeal. What an amazing way for God to exercise the capacity resident in his name. He would become flesh and the fullness of the manifestation of the Godhead bodily would spring forth from David's line as David became a house for the Lord. Chapter 7 continues with God telling David what he intended to do through David and of David's response to the Most High God in which he'd come to fully trust. No study of the book of 2 Samuel would be complete without a rehearsal of the remainder of this magnificent chapter. I want you to see this. Um, 
Let's pick it up at verse 12 where God continued to tell David what to expect concerning his offspring. Here it is. Chapter 7, beginning with verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Now what a thing to be told. The one being spoken of here was Solomon, in a direct sense, who was not yet born to David, although Christ would be the ultimate fulfillment of this passage. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. Solomon would build the Lord a temporal residence through the building of an earthly temple. But how, however, in Christ Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of this passage, a spiritual house would be built. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye, speaking of believers, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So in a very real sense, we are God's building today, and Paul tells us that. Companion verse to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 is Ephesians 2, 22, where our apostle went on to write, in whom ye also, it's back on that passage, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are a house today. But in that day, God was telling David he was going to turn David into a house, and that's where the ultimate seed would come. And that ultimate seed would, would of course, be the one to sit on the throne of David. We can be reasonably certain that David didn't fully understand the majesty of all that God was promising to do through his lineage as Solomon would, again, not be the ultimate fulfillment of what God was telling David through Nathan. Uh, the ultimate fulfillment, as I said earlier, would be Jesus Christ himself. But, but watch God continue to relay to David what he had in store for the offspring that God had in mind as we come to verses 14 and 15 in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, this would definitely be Solomon, I will chase him with the rod of men, chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now, verse 14 says, if he commit iniquity, look at carefully, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now, some might question just how Jesus Christ could possibly be the ultimate fulfillment of that part of the verse we've just read. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men. We know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was incapable of committing, committing iniquity. However, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Israel's prophet Isaiah, who would come along later on in Israel's history to speak these words to the nation, as seen in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord, capitals, hath laid upon him, his son Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. So in that sense, the Lord Jesus Christ was bearing iniquity. He was bearing the iniquity of the world when he took on the sins of the world. David didn't have to understand all that, folks. David wasn't even alive when Israel's prophet Isaiah came along, much less when Jesus Christ came along. What David did understand is that God had a majestic plan in mind for his earthly nation. And God was promising to fulfill that plan through a son that would come through David's line. Can you imagine God speaking the words he was relaying to David to you? Now think about that for just a moment. Is there anything that you could do to merit such words being spoken from God directly to you where your lineage is concerned? Talk about awestruck. <laughs> wow. Shock and awe. <laughs> David had it. David had to be overcome with emotion, I think, and I know he was, and I'll show you he was, as David had to know that all that God was promising to do through him had nothing whatsoever to do with what David had done, was doing, or could ever do to bring about these promises that God was making uh, to David on his own. David couldn't do that. What a humbling awe-inspiring revelation David was hearing as Nathan was making God's plan known to the man God had chosen to be king over his nation. And God wasn't done. Notice verses 16 and 17. And thine house, David, you yourself, and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee, David. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. 
As I said earlier, what a humbling and awe-inspiring message uh, to hear for the one who'd lied to the high priest of Israel at Nob, the one who had been responsible, at least in a secondary sense, if not primary sense, for the deaths of 85 members of the priesthood of Nob, along with nearly the entire population of that city. For the one who had gone contrary to the law of Moses and multiplying wives to himself, and uh, for the one who added concubines to that harem that he held, David knew at this point, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that the exercise of God's name on his behalf had come not meritoriously, but graciously, the only way it could possibly come. You will not find a more heartfelt prayer, a more meaningful prayer, a more beautiful prayer uh, that, that contains a greater understanding of the meaning of God's name than the prayer that David poured out from his heart to the Lord in verses 18 through 29 right here in chapter 7. I encourage you sometimes, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to bed with, with the reading of this passage in King James playing in my ear because it's the most beautiful prayer you're going to find in your Bible with, that contains an understanding of who God is. Since this is such a beautiful prayer and a prayer that proves King David had learned the meaning of God's name and of God's grace, we need to include this prayer in this lesson. It's just 12 verses long, so we'll take them two at a time, beginning with verse 18. Listen to David pour out his heart knowing that there was no way that, uh, that he could ever merit. Wow, he got ahead, didn't he? 18, it's verse 18. Second Samuel chapter, chapter 7, beginning verse 18. There it is on the overhead. Now listen to this. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord and said, now imagine him. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. You've told me about things in the future. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. There sits David's acknowledgement of the education that God had given him and that David had gained. Verse 22 continues, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. He's including the nation in here. Verse 23, In what nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods? Verse 24, For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel, to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God, and now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant, meaning David himself, and concerning his house, David's house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore hath thy servants found in his heart to pray this prayer. Thy servant has found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Verse 28, And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Uh, that's beautiful. I don't know if you stopped to really think it through. That's beautiful. David went on to conquer all the, uh, those oppositionites that we've talked about that were in the land. Everyone he encountered, he conquered, as seen in 2 Samuel chapter 8. The expression that highlights King David's conquests in this chapter summarizes in a very real sense the power that was working on David's behalf appears in verses 6 and 14. There it says in verse 6, And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Verse 14, And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Uh, this was truly a glorious time uh, for the nation Israel, this 
interlude of blessing in this golden age. Chapter 8, verse 15 goes on to say, And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed just judgment and justice unto all his people. Israel and her king were indeed in their zenith. Uh, without question, God was exercising his name uh, on behalf of his nation and on behalf of her king. By the way, verse 15 is another example. Um, it's a great example, actually, of um, how King David typified the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back at verse 15 once again. And David reigned over all of Israel. Then verse 15 goes on to say, And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. Now, what will Christ be doing in the day yet future? Uh, notice this statement made by Israel's prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. We're speaking of Israel's Messiah to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet co proclaimed, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, that righteous branch being Jesus Christ himself, and a king shall reign and prosper, time future, and shall do what? Execute judgment and justice in the earth, just as David was doing in his day. David was reigning, prospering, and executing judgment and justice in his day, just as Jesus Christ will reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth in a day yet future, according to the prophet. Just about everywhere we look, we see an example of King David typifying the king that was to come. The difference, of course, being that David wasn't a king without sin. Um, there was never a point in the life of Christ when God's son was... Uh, had sin or was with sin. He was always without sin, um, with exception, of course, being the cross of Christ where God made his son to be sin for the world. David was reigning and prospering and executing judgment and justice unto all his people. To show his love for Jonathan, Saul's son, and his regard for the oath that he had sworn to Saul back in 1 Samuel chapter 24, um, that he would not cut off Saul's seed after him, David inquired as to whether Saul had any remaining offspring at this time. David's in his glory. And he wants to know if Saul's got any remaining offspring. This is the story of 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now when David learned that Jonathan, his dear friend who had died, had a living son named Mephibosheth, David sent for Saul's grandson. This was Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son. And he returned to that son, uh, Saul's grandson, John Jonathan's son, all the land that belonged to his grandfather Saul. The verses that highlight and in a sense encapsulate chapters, chapter 9 are verses 7 and 13 where we read, And David said unto him, unto Mephibosheth that is, Fear not, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I will restore to thee all the land of Saul thy father, grandfather, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So Mephibosheth, dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at King David's table and was lame on both of his feet. Certainly David was a gracious man, we can see that here, who believed in keeping his word. Uh, we've already seen his love for Saul and for Saul's son Jonathan. Uh, that became very ap apparent early on. God's nation and God's king were indeed in their heyday during the days of King David's reign. This was that second section, that, that, that David, the interlude of blessing that came before a bucket of wrath number two. Easy to see why this period of time in Israel's history is referred to as Israel's golden age. God was giving Israel a foretaste of the kingdom to come when his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign upon the earth from the very location where King David was reigning over Israel, namely Jerusalem. Now at this point in time, some might be tempted to think ahead. Uh, to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where Paul made this statement. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm sure there are some that, having read Paul's statement and reading David into it, suppose that at this point in David's life he had learned his lesson and had made the decision to cease from sin and commit his, Lord to, uh, commit his life to the Lord, and that perhaps that was the reason why God was blessing David to the extent that David was being blessed. Why, everything had become new for him. He'd finally got to that point where he repented of his sin and said, never more will I ever sin. First of all, we need to understand that David was not in Christ and that God had not joined believers to the person of his son at that time. The joining of believers to Christ would not come along until the rising of Jesus Christ from the dead had taken place. When the Apostle Paul taught Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, 
Paul was revealing the great truth of being baptized into the person of Christ. And by way of that baptism performed by the Holy Spirit, those so baptized would instantaneously become members of Christ's body, of his flesh and of his bones, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The old things that are passed away and the all things that are become new in the Second Corinthians passage is not referring to the believer's new behavior, but to the believer's new identification with the risen, ascended Savior. Some people believe that conduct is the key to understanding what Second Corinthians 5 verse 17 is all about. Not so in any way. To the contrary, Paul wasn't speaking about performance. In verse 17, he was speaking about our position in Christ. It isn't about the believer's actions, whether past, present, or future. It's about the believer's location that comes by way of Holy Spirit identification as God the Holy Spirit identifies every believer at the point of that person's belief with Christ himself by, journey, by joining all believers to Christ himself. The Holy Spirit places believers into Christ. We are well aware of these things. This is what being baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ is all about. But Christ had to be risen from the dead for Holy Spirit baptism to become a reality. So why was God blessing David at this point in time? It was not because David had decided to turn a new leaf, turn a new chapter in his life and start living right, as I say, flying right and honoring God and not sinning anymore. Here it is for those who haven't seen it, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's a simple verse we should have it memorized. For he, God the Father hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Christ who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God. How? In Christ. David had not become a member of Christ's body, of his flesh and of his bones. God knew that would come along soon enough, but because Christ hadn't gone to Calvary at that time. He had not died for the sins of the world. He had not risen from the dead, although God had that in mind at the time. Christ had not even come on the scene when David was king over Israel. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it talks about old things being passed away, all things becoming new, Paul has our new identification with our ascended Savior in mind, which has to do with the believer's new identification in Christ. That, former, that believer's former identification with the first Adam being totally eradicated. That passage has nothing to do with the eradication of the believer's sin nature, though. All things becoming new is about our new identification in His perfectly righteous Son. So for those who may have supposed that God preserved David from the days of his youth and then promised an everlasting kingdom to David's offspring due to the fact that David's former sinning days were now over, all things having become new for David from the standpoint of sin, you'd better think again because that's not how it was with David. There couldn't be any greater proof that God's hand had been on David's life, not because of his newfound behavior, but because of what God had foreknown about David's belief, than what we're about to see happen next in King David's life. You see, we've come to 2 Samuel chapter 11 as we move through this second book. If you think that all things had become new from the perspective of performance and absence of sin for God's chosen king, who had already become a recipient of all God's promises of an everlasting kingdom for a son, to come from David's loins, bless David beyond belief, then chapter 11 is proof positive that it wasn't David's behavior, but David's belief that gave God reason to exercise his name on David's behalf. Let's move into chapter 11, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Many of you already know the passage. You know the story. Let's pick it up with verse 1 in chapter 11. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, David's been blessed beyond anything he could possibly be blessed by, at the time when kings go forth to battle. They didn't go forth to battle in the winter time. So it was a time when they did go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Uh, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. David's not going along on this conflict. Now, as you may recall, Joab was David's nephew and he was the commander of Israel's forces during this time. Well, Moab, or Joab rather, had taken those forces to the northeastern side of the Dead Sea to fight against the Ammonites. Can you see it there? Gone from Jerusalem up to Rabbah, and he's going to fight against the Ammonites, as you can see on our Jacob's, or Joab's, Joab fights the Ammonites map. Where was King David again? Well, David had decided to remain at Jerusalem. He's not a part of this battle. Verse 1 said that David sent Joab, the commander of Israel's forces, along with Joab's servants, and then it goes on to say, and all Israel 
This tells us that all of the men of fighting age, which would have been 20 and upwards, were gone to battle. Whoa, not very many men left in Jerusalem at that point in time, were there? I think you can now see what was setting the stage for what was uh, about to happen next, which is revealed in verses 2 and 3. He's one of the few men remaining because all, most of the men of Israel, fighting age at least, were gone to battle. Verse 2, And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. She was taking a bath. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? David wasn't asking that question so he might inform Uriah the Hittite to close off that area where his wife was taking her baths. Uh, and he wasn't seeking that information to find out more about his neighbors and their, heritage, their Hittite heritage. Uh, Christ, who would come along much later down the road in Israel's history, said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said of them in old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The one who had lied to the high priest of Israel earlier on, the one who had been responsible for the deaths of the priesthood and the people of Nob, the one who had gone directly contrary to the law of Moses by multiplying wives to himself and adding concubines to that mix, the one who had been blessed beyond being blessed when it came to his future offspring, had now become a peeping Tom in direct violation of another of the dictates of the law program. The one we find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Suffice it to say, King David wasn't the least bit interested in Uriah's house. <laughs> nor his domestic help, nor his cattle. <laughs> David was lusting, at, lusting after Uriah's wife. And the story that follows tells us that Israel's king wouldn't be satisfied with lusting in his heart. He had already broken the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And it wouldn't be long before he would be guilty of breaking the 7th commandment as well because adultery was right on the heels for this king as revealed in verses 4 and 5. And David sent messengers and he took Bathsheba. He took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent to David and said, I am with child. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh for this king. Of course, I'm sure that most folks know that Bathsheba was a married woman. Uh, why was it necessary to include that finite detail in verse 4 that Bathsheba was purified from her uncleanness? Where are the men? Well, they're off, they're off fighting, are they not? And why would it be necessary to include that she was purified from her uncleanness? That tells us there was no chance whatsoever, no possibility of the child she was going to bear being a child conceived by Uriah, her husband. This will prove that King David would be the undeniable father of this baby. But lust and adultery wouldn't be the only failure of David's flesh. David sent notice to Joab, the commander of Israel's forces who had been fighting against those Ammonites at that time, to send Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, back to Jerusalem. David wanted to see him. He wanted to confront the husband of this woman that he'd been lying with. When Uriah came to David, the king asked him how Joab was doing, and how the battle against the Ammonites had been going. Of course, David had something else in mind altogether. I'm sure that David had been keeping in touch with Joab, the commander of his forces. David was employing deception, folks, because he wanted to get a message to Joab. And to show you the perversity of David's heart, deceitful above all things, even David didn't know it, God knew it, during this whole sordid affair, he was going to send that message to Joab by way of Uriah himself. Uriah was going to carry his own death sentence in his hand back to Joab. Needless to say, that message should not be meant to benefit Bathsheba's husband. <laughs> Let's return to the story and we'll pick it up in verse 13. And when David had called him, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, he did eat and drink before David, and David made him drunk 
And at evening, in even, the evening time, when he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house, um, he went out to sleep outside with the servants and not down to his house. Why? He said, why, while all of the soldiers are sleeping outside, you want me to go down and be with my wife in the comfort of a house when everybody else is out fighting and living in tents? Verse 14, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in this letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him. Don't be there to come to his aid. That he may be smitten and die. And who's carrying the letter? Uriah himself is carrying this letter back to Joab. Was David a package of performance perfection? And yet the Lord had already blessed him beyond measure, knowing ahead of time what David was going to do. Uriah was an honorable man, as a more detailed look at the story bears out. The only cause for David to bring about Uriah's death was David's intentions to take for himself Uriah's wife. As can be plainly seen, David was plotting murder. His loyal nephew, Joab, commander of Israel's forces, would carry it out. But David, being the, being the king of Israel, meant that David was commander-in-chief over Joab. How could Joab not comply with his commander-in-chief? Did David's plot work? Well, it worked very well, according to verses 16 and 17. It worked just as David had plotted it, just as David had meant it to work. Notice, and it came to pass when Joab observed the city, he was going to besiege that city, the city the Israelite forces were besieging, that Joab assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew the valiant men were, those valiant men being the valiant fighters that were opposing Israel. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So now we can add murder to David's account. With everything else that he'd done, murder. David had been the one who had ordered it. David had hadn't ordered the death of the priesthood and the people of Nob, although David's lie had been directly responsible, had been the catalyst that had brought that slaughter about. While we could say that David was responsible for the deaths of Nob in a secondary sense, the death of Uriah was lying clearly at the foot of the king David's door. And to think that David had, been sent, had actually sent for Uriah's death, the notice of that, through a message that David had Uriah deliver. Talk about a sinister scheme. And to show you the part that Joab played, Joab knew all about David's battle prowess. Joab knew that David wouldn't place his forces directly in harm's way by having them move right up to the city's walls and within easy reach of the enemy's arrows and spears. David would have never done that. But this is precisely what Joab had some of the men do. And he made sure that Uriah was among that highly endangered group. Why would they not go right up to the wall? Because you were setting yourself right in the line of fire. You're down there and these people can just throw whatever they want to throw at you. Uriah was among that endangered group. Joab employed a strategy that had not only resulted in Uriah's death, but that, result, that strategy resulted in the death of a number of Israel's army. So Joab had been willing to sacrifice a number of men in order to get David's desire for Uriah's death done. And done it was. So David didn't just kill Uriah, if you think he was guilty of murder one. <laughs> he, was, he was guilty of murder, murder multiple one because a lot of the soldiers died. Of course, Bathsheba mourned um, the husband that she had lost in battle, knowing nothing at all about the fact that David had been the one responsible for bringing that death about. And David allowed her that time of mourning. Had David made his move earlier, folks, he would have pointed the spotlight at the attentions that he had all along. But as soon as her time of mourning was over, David sent for Bathsheba to be brought into his house. He then took Bathsheba as his wife, and Bathsheba bore to David the son of his sin, we could say. Now, there may be some who would say that had God known what David was going to do where Bathsheba was concerned, God wouldn't have blessed David earlier to the extent that he did. But the fact is, God did know. God had known all along what David was going to do of David's own volition before David was ever born. And God had been with David, as we read more than once in our previous sessions, all of David's life. <laughs> 
And then after all of the earlier failures of David's flesh, God continued to exercise his name on David's behalf. Look back with me at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9, where God made this statement to Israel's king. And I was with thee whither, whithersoever thou wentest, David, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. And then on top of all that, to tell David that he would establish the throne of, uh, of the kingdom of one of David's sons forever, which would mean the preservation of David's house, of David's kingdom, of David's lineage forever, as God promised in verse 16, and thine house, David, he said, won't put it on the overhead, and thine house, David, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Not to mention the fact that the nation Israel would experience an everlasting deliverance through the son that would come from David's loins. If this isn't proof that God's righteousness comes by way of belief rather than by way of behavior, I don't know what is. God, having foreknowledge, knew all about David, the failures of David's flesh before David ever had an opportunity to make his first effective decision. Yet at the same time, God had always had a foreknowledge of David's belief. The question is, would David's sins catch up with him? Uh, would there be a consequence to David's sin? This is where we have to remember that God dealt with the people of Israel according to a law contract called the Law of Moses. That law contract called for physical blessings and physical cursings in order that the Israelites might realize their incapacity to keep that law perfectly and consistently. Confess that failure and then call upon God and trust in God to exercise His name on their behalf graciously. Obviously, David had become so caught up in the power and the prestige of his position that he had lost focus of how he obtained that position in the first place. Of course, the flesh bent on satisfying its own lusts, gloats in the achievements of the flesh. The story of King David's arrogance at this point in his life sits as everlasting evidence that in the flesh dwelleth how much? No good thing. As the Apostle Paul would later state, of his own flesh in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, here it is, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I, I can't find it. What was true of the Apostle Paul was no less true of King David, folks. David was not to be deprived of anything that he wanted. His flesh wasn't to be deprived. Apart from the grace of God and God exercising his name on their behalf, neither Paul nor David would have had the positions in which God placed them. But as we've already clearly seen, God placed both men precisely where he placed them because of what he had foreknown about their belief, not because of what he had foreknown about their behavior. The law of Moses called for God to bring about adverse physical consequences upon those of Israel who made inappropriate fleshly choices. In other words, the law had physical cons consequences written into it. In that sense, the law called for God to become the judge of the flesh. If, God, if Israel walked contrary to God, the law called for God to walk contrary to Israel and for Israel to be able to see God himself bring adverse consequences their way. Today, God is not causing bad things to happen to anyone, whether good or bad, from the perspective of the righteousness of anyone's flesh. God had, has already judged sins where? In the flesh of his son. Um, and he's judged the sins of the flesh of men in the body of his son, according to Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, and that Jesus Christ became son on behalf of all men. And you that were formerly alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he or past tense, reconciled in the body of his Christ flesh through Christ's death to present you holy and unblameable and irreprovable in his sight. Wow. So when we sin today, and we all do, we simply reap the consequences that comes as a result, the natural result, we could call it, of our faulty choices. God isn't the one bringing those adverse circumstances our way. The sin-cursed world in which we live, the wrongful choices that we make, bring those circumstances our way. We'll call those the natural consequences of faulty choices. In David's day, he could not only expect to reap the natural consequences of his sinful decisions, he could ex also expect, according to the law contract, for God to step in with what we might call a supernatural consequence for David's sin. Notice how 2 Samuel chapter 11 comes to an end. And when Bathsheba, verse 27... Bathsheba's time of mourning was past, 
David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But, and here it comes, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. End of chapter 11. What a telling statement. In our next lesson, we'll look at the consequences of David's behavior, both in light of the natural consequences David brought on himself, and also in light of the adverse consequence that God was going to bring David's way in light of Israel working under a law contract. We'll look at that in our next session. We'll stop there today. We'll pick it up uh, next week.